A missing child. A bomb disguised as a Christmas gift. A civil rights era Klan murderer brought to justice. Join David Ridgen as he and victims' family members track down leads, speak to suspects, and search for answers in the CBC's hit cold case podcast, Someone Knows Something. Subscribe to SKS wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. Dante, Anin, Buju, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. June is National Indigenous History Month, so we figured it was the perfect time to look at the Indian Act. There is no piece of legislation that has had more of an influence on the lives of First Nation people in Canada than the Indian Act. Originally passed in 1878, it outlines everything from the current reserve structure to the creation of residential schools. This week on Unreserved, author and educator Bob Joseph will help guide us through the Indian Act. And we'll hear from First Nation people who are challenging what it means to be a status Indian. In 2015, Bob Joseph, member of the Gwawa'anuk Nation, wrote an article about the many ways the Indian Act was destructive to First Nation communities and culture. The article went viral. He has since expanded that article and in 2018 released the book, 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. He's my guest today. Think of him as our Indian Act tour guide to help us better understand the impact of this historic legislation. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So your original article on the Indian Act went viral. What kinds of responses were were you getting from the article? Lots of, uh, you know, wow, I didn't know that and, you know, sort of the aha moments. And we're still getting responses today, you know, on Twitter and Facebook where people are still saying, you you got to read this book. Every Canadian must read this book. And you don't know what you don't know. You'd be surprised how many times you hear that. You know, mm. we do our training workshops as well. And I do a training for a living on, you know, sort of Indigenous awareness training. And one of the exercises that we have people do at the start of every session is that they think of a date in history and come up with a short sentence to describe it. And it's got to be specific, though, to uh, Indigenous peoples. And I have a flip chart at the front. And I, I say, you know, we're going to put all of the old dates at the top of the flip chart and the more recent ones at the bottom. And I usually draw a line, you know, 1867 and then another line when we patriated the uh, Constitution and Section 35 and 1982. And we get people to start putting in their dates. And so what we find is Jacques Cartier and, you know, Columbus discovering the New World and Vikings and things like that. And then you see a lot of recent dates, the 2010 Winter Olympics and things that are more recent oriented Oka and those kinds of things. But we always saw this gap in the middle. And it was usually between 1867 and 1982. Hmm. And it really just highlights what people don't know. There's a big period of history there, and, and a lot of those dates, Indian Act dates, fall right in that timeline. And I would venture yeah. to say they don't know too much about the uh, Indian Act. In fact, most people have never even read that legislation. What is one element of it that always surprises people? For for a lot of people, they think that uh, people living on reserves and under the Indian Act live in some kind of uh, Shangri-La, that, you know, there's free housing and free education and they don't pay taxes. Those seem to be some of the bigger issues. But when we when we talk about things like, yes, they don't pay taxes, Section 87 of the Indian Act was put into place to protect their property from the erosion of taxes while they were assimilating. So that's what the Indian Act is. It's a post-Confederation assimilation policy tool. So we're going to protect their property from the erosion of taxes. On the face of it, it sounds really helpful, but you know, we look at it in a more current context. It really just holds the, uh, the nations back. If I wanted to go buy a truck from a a car dealership. If I had it delivered to the reserve because I'm a status Indian, I don't pay transactional taxes on that vehicle if it's delivered to the reserve. That definitely is a benefit that people see. But what they don't see is that as soon as I declare the exemption, reserves are also not subject to seizure under legal process. And so as soon as I declare the exemption, the financial services people know, 
okay, he's a status Indian. If I sell him this, this truck and he stops paying for it, I can't go and take it back from him uh, if, if he refuses to pay for it. Very often see the benefits, but they don't see some of the restrictions and some of the other things that are problematic with the Indian Act. Now, the Indian Act was passed, as you mentioned, in 1876, and it impacts the lives of First Nations people every day in almost every way. It mm-hmm. defines who has Indian status outlines Mm -hmm. chief and council systems, influences Mm -hmm. the development of residential schools. As a First Nations person, what is one surprising way the Act influences your life today? When I was uh, just starting out my career working for a big firm here in British Columbia, by then I'd had a post-secondary education. I was working for a really reputable, solid organization. And when I look at it from a capital lender sort of perspective, I I met the four C's of credit. I was married. I had a job. I had a post-secondary education. If I was a lender, I was the perfect candidate, but Mm -hmm. um, they refused to uh, loan me the money and wanted my wife, who's not Indigenous, to co-sign for um, the vehicle, which was quite interesting just in terms of uh, that whole understanding and the impacts of, uh, you know, trying to make way in the economic mainstream. Now, I want to get into one of the most long-lasting impacts of the Indian Act, the Canadian Reserve System. Many First Nations across the country still live on reserves. Why did the government create the reserve system? The reserve system was really created as part of this whole philosophy. By the time we confederate, Canada believed that the Indians, as they're called in the Indian Act, were a dying race of people, that they're not going to be here for much longer. Uh, They were going through very rapid depopulation because of diseases that they didn't have immunity to, and they weren't fitting in economically. And so it set the stage for this uh, dying race of people. The best thing we can do is help them to assimilate and become like everybody else. And the feeling was was that we would put them onto these reserves. In the context of assimilation, a reserve is really a holding pen. It's a place where we we're going to put them until they assimilated. And if they assimilated, that meant that obviously that they were going to leave the reserves and go be like all other people in Canada. And they are reserves. Um, mm-hmm. People that live on them don't actually own the lands they live on. You can ask people, hey, do you, do you own that house? Legally, technically speaking, the property is that of the federal government, and mm-hmm. the band is sort of the administrator of that. And, Which and people so. don't know, right? That they don't know that this is crown land, actually, and it's held in trust, as mm-hmm. the term goes. And even though the government set aside this, you know, this land to First Nations, there are many instances where they went back on their word and took acres away from communities. In your book, you outline how parts of Vancouver and the surrounding area were taken back by the government to create the city as it is today. Can you explain how that happened? Yeah, so there, there was a, a lot of that. And initially, we put them onto uh, reserves and often, for the most part, left them where they were situated, which is maybe different from the U.S. where they relocated people, you know, thousands of miles sometimes from where they were from. But they, they would put them onto these reserves. So you think about a, a place like uh, Vancouver. Today, there's just lots and lots of people and urban sprawl. But in those days, there wasn't much there. And so they put up nice, generous reserves with good allotment. But then we went back and took it away because they weren't being enterprising peoples. You know, they're supposed to use those lands and put them to their highest and best use. And so it's kind of this really weird argument, right? We want them to assimilate, but we don't want to uh, compete with them in the markets. And so we take away their, one of the things is their ability to sell off of reserve. They can't sell without written permission from the Indian agent or the Department of Indian Affairs. And so we prohibit their selling. So now they're not putting their lands to their highest and best use. So we've got to take those lands away and give them to enterprising farmers. That's sort of the, I think, the cruelty of the Indian Act. And when we look Mm -hmm. at it in that historical context. And so how much of the the land was, you know, initially given and then taken back? It's uh, really hard to say because the policy was, is really quite fractured when mm. it comes to uh, reserve creation in Canada. We think about the prairie provinces, you know, there are quite large allotments in the prairies because obviously, you know, they were thinking maybe people would get into agriculture and a lot of the old treaties from the prairies are what they call ox and plow treaties. So they definitely had some thoughts when they were creating those reserves. So, you know, you might have a community that's getting hundreds of acres per family of five. 
the one we look back to the BC context, you know, 0.36 of 1% of BC's total land was reserve land. So less, less than a percent. But then when you put it into that context of rocks and trees, only about 15% of BC's land is arable, which means you can do something like farming with it or that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Indian Act also outlines how a reserve should be run. Specifically, it introduced a new political system, which people mm-hmm. have no idea about. They're mm-hmm. not aware that today's chief and council governments are not traditional, they're not based in any sort of cultural reference. In fact, it was outlined in the Indian Act how that system would, would look. Look, so what mm-hmm. is the role of chief and council? I've always told uh, you know people in our classes that the role of chief and council was to do the work of the Department of Indian Affairs. So they're elected by their people, but they're really accountable to Indian Affairs. And their primary responsibilities were really around health care, housing, and education. Certainly not designed to approve uh, major infrastructure projects. And I think Canadians are starting to get a little bit of a glimpse on that in, in sort of the big infrastructure stuff that's happening now. They're starting to see, wait a second, there's these other these other chiefs, these hereditary chiefs. Then you got these band chiefs. And so they're starting to get a sense of the difference between the two. And it really is, uh, you know, to come in and, and say, look, uh, the way you're governing yourselves is totally wrong and it's backwards. You need to elect a chief and council like everybody else. <laughs> and also has to be noted that before the Indian Act, Indigenous communities, as you said, had their own forms of government. Mm-hmm. So what would be the purpose of that? Why did the Canadian government decide to overrule those systems? Assimilation is what it sounds like. We're trying to get them to give up who they are and become like everybody else. They saw these uh, forms of Indigenous governments as really an impediment to that process. And as long as they were having their hereditary chiefs and matriarchs and elders and, you know, whatever that that social structure looks like for indigenous communities, it was in the way of assimilation. So we've got to make them, you know, elect the chief and council. So it's a direct imposition on those self-governing communities to require them to elect a chief and council. You know, when we talk about land use decisions, the, the real question is who has the legitimate and legal authority to make decisions about Section 35 rights. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, getting rid of the Indian Act and opening the door to uh, governance conversations for communities, um, I think, is a a positive step forward, you know, for the country and for communities as well. So one of the other things that the Act outlines is that these are only every two years. Elections Mm -hmm. are required to happen every two years, which Mm -hmm. was actually strategic. How does this limit what chief and council can accomplish? Well, you know, if you studied band politics, you spend six months shaking hands and kissing babies and and, uh, you get elected and then you spend six months getting your feet under you to try to be effective and looking after health care, housing and education. And then you've got about a year where you can actually do things. Very problematic for the communities where everybody else has, you know, three, four year terms, maybe Uh even longer. We really strap them with these two year election cycles. So it's not enough time to do anything or to to get any traction. And, so you're just uh, kind of running in, sp- in the same spot. Yeah, yeah. And we see it being a problem with our own, say, federal national elections. It's just sometimes it's just not long enough to do something that maybe would make sense. That was Bob Joseph, my guest today. He's guiding us through the many ways the Indian Act continues to impact First Nations people in Canada. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Still ahead. How a First Nation in Alberta was the first and only band to entirely enfranchise a legal process that takes away a First Nation person's Indian status. The department started to set in motion a committee that would be in charge of enfranchising the reserve, the whole reserve. And it was the committee that made the decision under Section 112 of the Indian Act, because that section of the Indian Act did not require the band's consent for enfranchisement. They had to change the law so that they could enfranchise the whole reserve. In 1958, uh, they passed an order in council, allowing the entire band to be enfranchised. They would, in quotation marks, cease to be Indians. There were 115 members and 56 of them were adults. So some of them were children who were enfranchised as well. That's coming up in just a few minutes. The Indian Act has had such an impact on the lives of First Nation people that some artists are making art commenting on the historic and present ways the Act influences their lives. 
Hi, my name is Emma Hassensel Perley. I'm Willistigwe or Malseed from Nagutguk or Tobik First Nation in New Brunswick. I've been making art since I was probably three, since I could hold a crayon, my mom says. As of right now, I live in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I'm working as an emerging curator at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. I'm also an, an instructor at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design, and I maintain my own practice as a visual artist. In my work, I'm critiquing the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the settler state of Canada. In my art practice, I explore the term legislative identity, like how the Indian Act has impact on our identities as Indigenous peoples in Canada. I also do work around my own identity as a Willistigwe woman. My interest in using the Indian Act started in 2014 when I was attending Mount Allison University and I was assigned a book work project in a second year drawing class. We were asked to distort a book in some way and I asked my professor, does it have to be a book or can it be a document? And he says, it can be a document and I think I know where we're going with this. The Indian Affairs office was 15 minutes from my school and so I drove over there and asked them for their copy of the Indian Act. You can print them out online, but I really wanted that effort of going in and making that request to be part of the process. And so the office gave me a copy and I took it back to school and ran it through a paper shredder. I then bonded the pieces to the red parts of a standard size Canadian flag. And that work is called White Flag. White Flag speaks to nationhood and the forced adoption of the Indian Act in our communities because the Act completely rejects and opposes Indigenous sovereignty and traditional governance, clan systems, treaties, etc. And by abiding by the Act, it becomes kind of ingrained in our subconscious and daily life, and that's where I'm taking this exploration in terms of our identities. After the flag was finished, I still had like half a bag of Indian Act left, and so I decided to keep exploring. The dress was the sister piece of that previous work, and this dress is called Atlamia, and it means she keeps praying in Wulistigwe. Same idea as before, except this is Indian Act shreds on red jingle dress or red fabric. I was actually really nervous to incorporate Indian Act shreds into the jingle dress because it has such a specific purpose. And I didn't know how that would resonate with some people. As a jingle dress dancer, you have a responsibility to pray for healing in your community or in your family or your friends or other people that are in need of, of that healing. And so it's a really powerful dance. And I think to incorporate that into this concept around the Indian Act, is it's about like praying for something better, or praying for a better situation, because the Indian Act has caused so much destruction in our communities and cultural tragedies. I sat on the dress idea for about a year before I executed it, and I made it to fit my body so that I could dance and perform in it because I figured that eventually the paper would start to tear off and that I would have to make repairs. But now I think that it becomes part of this ongoing performance and that the more I dance, the Indian act starts to wither away. That was Wallistic Way artist Emma Hassan Sel Perley from Tobique First Nation. Her art explores how the Indian Act continues to influence the lives of First Nation people. To check out her photos of her work, visit our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today we're talking about the Indian Act with my guest, Bob Joseph. He wrote the book, 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. 
Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive about the status of uh, First Nations women under the Indian Act. Uh, women weren't they treated the same as, as men. Can you give an example? First of all, the, the whole intermarriage thing. As a status Indian man, I could marry a woman from any culture if she was non-Indigenous, which my wife is non-Indigenous. Uh, if I married her before... 1985, she would gain her status and so would her children. But in that same time period, Indian women who married non-Indian men would lose their status and so would their children. And if you lost your status, that meant you had to leave the reserve. The reserves are set aside for the mm-hmm. use and benefit of status Indians, not non-status Indians, especially during the heyday of assimilation. And uh, it really took that patriated constitution again in 1982 to open up the door. In fact, it was uh, Native Women's Association of Canada and other sort of like groups. As soon as we patriate the Constitution, it's got a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And 1982 is a pretty big turning point because Mm -hmm. that that opened up the door to a human rights complaint that would finally put an end to the inequities of the Indian Act, where women would lose their status simply for marrying, you know, sort of outside of the community. Well... Did it, though, because um, even though there was that amendment made to the Indian Act, the C-31 in 1985, mm-hmm. which gave back status to many women who had been not been denied, it didn't really completely give them back their status. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. And it's a good point that you're making. To me, these are just little Band-Aids that you're putting on this great big, you know, really. Gushing wound. Yeah, it's like a compound injury that really needs a tourniquet. And that's the problem with the Indian Act and really partly why I wanted to uh, write about it. It's just to to let people know is that it really was designed for a purpose. Here's one of the, the neat sort of, I guess it's a paradox when I'm talking to the learners. We're talking about an instrument that was designed and, and we threw the full legislative legal authority of the Canadian state at it for a hundred plus years Mm -hmm. to try and assimilate people, but it didn't work. And I don't think it didn't work because we're strong, proud people and we towed the line and we weren't giving up our Indianness. If you want people to assimilate, you do not put them under completely separate laws and on completely separate lands than anybody else. Assimilation is actually a natural process. If I meet you and we go out for dinner, you take me to some place that you really like and you have a food that you really like, you know, if you've got good food, that's the first thing that will bring us together. And then we can start to share political and philosophical and spiritual ideas. And it'll grow from that by putting them onto these sort of separate places, you know. If we could call it a mistake was, uh, and it's been more of a, maybe of a blessing for community to help them hang on to identity is putting them under separate laws and then onto separate lands from everybody else. It just, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? It, it, it is. It's just not the way to do it. Bob Joseph is the writer of 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. To read his original blog post that inspired the book, visit our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. Lynn Gell is an Algonquian Anishinaabe writer and advocate who for years was denied Indian status under the Indian Act. She was caught in a years-long battle with the federal government, not only to receive her status, but to also change the sex-based discrimination in the Indian Act. She joins me from Peterborough. Welcome, Lynn. Oh, Kwe Kwe, miigwech for having me. So for more than 30 years, you fought to gain Indian status, and in 2017, you finally won that battle. And now you're a member of Pikwakinagon First Nation and a citizen of the Anishinaabek Nation. Why were you originally denied this status? It had to do with the matrilineal exclusion from the Indian Act. So eventually the Indian Act was written that you were only an Indian if your father or your husband was an Indian. And so my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather were um, deemed white people because their Indian lineage came through their mother lines. So um, my uh, indigenous or Indian lineage comes through my grandmother line on my father's side. And both my grandmothers, both of my her parents were uh, Indians. Her mother was Anne Jane and uh, her father was Joseph Gagne. 
But Joseph Gandhi was only an Indian through his mother, which would be my great-great-grandmother. And uh, his father was white. And so when the Indian Act codified the patrilineal requirement that Indianness was traveled through your father line, Joseph Gagne was no longer considered an Indian. And, and his wife, Anne Jane, who was also an Algonquin, she, because she married Joseph, she was deemed a white person. I see. And so under the Indian Act, she was then denied status. Yes, yes. And her husband, Joseph Gagne, were denied Indian status. And so then what happened was is um, in, in the 1930s, they were escorted off the reserve called Golden Lake at the time and rendered homeless, really. So as well as repercussions for your family, it also had repercussions for you. You grew up without status. How did people in the community treat you as a result of that? So my grandmother and her parents were removed from the reserve community, and they lived off the reserve. And then my grandmother had a child who was my father, Rodney Peter Gagne. And he ended up living in Toronto. And we we were denied who we were as Indigenous people. Who we were as Indigenous people went underground. It was never spoken about, but it was there in different ways. Um, for example, my father did um, take us to Golden Lake and made sure we knew who we were related to, who our cousins were, who our second cousins were. And we... We had friends there. They treated us okay, but again, we weren't allowed to live there. What about in terms of money and resources? I understand that reserves are quite stringent in terms of who gets these resources and money. How about, what, did, what happened with your experience? We had no resources. Our treaty rights were denied to us because my great-grandmother and great-grandfather were deemed white people, so we had absolutely no treaty rights and no benefits our dental, our health care, my education, none of it was covered. Were you aware of your Indigenous heritage, or how did that play out for you? It was never discussed openly. It was brought to us through the practices, such as going to the reserve, visiting the reserve, being introduced to cousins and second cousins. So it was through practice versus oral discussion, because it was pushed underground. There's, there was a lot of shame and secrecy there. But at the level of practice, my father was teaching us that we were Algonquin people, but he would never say it ex- explicitly. He would never claim it. And um, I had to do a lot of thinking <laughs> about what was going on. Yeah. And when did you realize that this was something that was legislated, that you were purposely left out of the status, you know, column? Did you have a moment like that? And what did you do? Well, eventually, I started to learn how to read and write at a later stage. And I um, just started to think more about things as an Indigenous person. I was working for the Ontario government, and I was getting some exposure there to who I was as an Indigenous person. And then in 1985, I was 23 years old at the time. And that was when the Indian Act was amended to bring it in line with the Charter. And that was a very exciting uh, moment for me. It was a moment where I felt it was more easy for me to walk into who I was as an Indigenous person. Mm -hmm. Now, that that amendment you're talking about uh, in 1985 was under Bill C-31, which was meant as you said, to correct those discriminatory aspects. And a lot of these changes impacted women, but things didn't really get better. Instead, the amendment created different levels of status uh, for Indigenous women, First Nations women. Can you explain what that means, different levels of status? Sure. So that's right. In 1985, what they did is all the men and their descendants, they gave them all 61A status, which refers to a particular section of the Indian Act known as, you know, 61A, and it's it's the strongest form of Indian status. The men and all their descendants and their wives, white wives, born before 1985 were given 61A status. But the women who were reinstated, such as my great-grandmother, they gave them what's known as Section 61C status. And through that difference of C versus A, what ended up happening was 
the second generation cutoff rule began to uh, apply to them and their descendants immediately. Yet with the men and their descendants born before 85, the second generation cutoff rule begins after 1985. And what that means is after two generations of parenting with a non-Indian person, Indian status no longer is conferred. It confuses a lot of people, but it's very similar to if we, as a Canadian, move to Britain, their child would be entitled to Canadian citizenship, but not their grandchild. It's like two generation cut off. And so what I had to do was upgrade my grandmother to prove that both her parents were entitled to Indian status. And then they they made her a 6-1 Indian and my father a 6'2 Indian. And because my father was only a 6'2 Indian, he couldn't confer it to me. I was hit with what's known as the second generation cutoff rule, even though I was born before 1985, and so was my father born before 1985. That is a very confusing amount of numbers, Lynn. (laughs) (laughs) So essentially what you're saying is that through the men's line, they were given status, full status. Yes. So you you have made some progress in your own battle to receive status, but uh, you're not finished yet. What's happening now with the case? I've continued to help uh, Sharon MacGyver on her work where she ended up going to the United Nations asking for what's known as 61A all the way for all the women who are reinstated and all their descendants born before 1985. Eventually, her United Nations petition was heard, and just recently, actually, and the United Nations said, bring into force the 61A all the way clauses. Trudeau issued an order in council and proclaimed them all as law. Thank you so much, Lynn, for your time today. Thank you. Lynn Gell is an advocate and writer of several books. After a 32-year battle with the federal government, Lynn got her Indian status back in 2017. But her fight against sex-based discrimination in the Indian Act is not done. While some First Nation people are fighting to gain status under the Indian Act, others are trying to get rid of it. Coming up, how Isaac Murdoch was inspired by the words of his mother to get rid of his status. So I remember my mother talking about the rights and freedoms of Indigenous peoples. And she said that there was something very wrong with how Indigenous people were being treated. And so she was always very active with missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so she knew that there was a systemic racist issue within the system of Canada and that there was a genocide that was happening against Indigenous people. She always said that, you know, we have to to make a stand. And I remember when Nelson Mandela was trying to be freed from prison, I felt that it was a really good idea at that point not to be a part of the Indian Act. And my mother said that uh, my life would be better without it. That's coming up in just a few minutes. You're listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Enfranchisement is the legal process by which First Nation people give up their Indian status for the promise of gaining the same rights as non-Indigenous Canadians. It was typically a decision independently made by a First Nation person, But in the case of the Michelle Band in Alberta, it was a choice forced on the entire community. Selena Lawyer is a member of the Michelle Band and is the Indigenous programmer for the Musée Heritage Museum in St. Albert. She spent years researching the history of her community to curate an exhibit for the museum. Michelle Callahue was the son of Louis Guardacalante, who was an Iroquois who came west with the fur trade, and he signed an adhesion to Treaty 6 in 1878 at Fort Edmonton. So the band was located in between the little towns of Calhoun and Villeneuve, so about 29 miles northwest of Edmonton. It was uh, 40 square miles of land that was set aside. There was a big push by the federal government for Indian bands to surrender their lands The largest um, enfranchisement that happened to a group first was in 1928. The people of Michelle were sending their children to the mission school in St. Albert. It was a residential school known as the the Uville Convent or the Uville Residential School. People of Michelle wanted to have a school built on the reserve because they no longer wanted their children 
to go to the residential school in St. Albert. They heard the stories from their children of what was going on there, and they were no longer willing to send their children there. In 1928, 10 families, basically one third of the band, voluntarily enfranchised. They asked if they could have a school built on the reserve, and they were told they would have to enfranchise, which means lose their rights, and sell the land. And then when the land was sold, they would be given a a share of the proceeds and buy that land back, and then they'd be able to have a school just off the reserve on the corner of the land. They chose to enfranchise, so there was 41 people altogether, and they built a school called the Michael School, and the children from that area went to that school. Basically, the parents had to choose between, do I continue to send my child to the residential school or do I choose to lose the rights that I'm owed under the treaty so that my children will be safe? As time went on, like the idea of enfranchisement kept coming back. Johnny Rogers was uh, one of the strongest proponents of enfranchisement of the whole reserve. And he was told he would only be allowed to enfranchise in 1931 if the whole band were included in the enfranchisement. The government actually was hoping that if they could get them all to enfranchise, it would set the pattern for other bands to enfranchise. There were numerous times that Johnny Rogers attempted to um, enfranchise. And so he started to become a very, very strong proponent, along with a man named Sammy Calhoun. There were a couple of other gentlemen. During the Second World War, Johnny Rogers and Sammy and a few of the other men went off to the to the war. So they were fighting alongside other people. They were treated equally to everyone else. They were allowed the same rights as everybody else. When they came back after the war, when they returned, they did not receive the same benefits that other veterans did. And they basically went back to being second-class citizens. At that time, Indians still could not leave the reserve without a pass. They could not go into any drinking establishment, even the Legion, if they had been to war. They could not, they couldn't even vote, even at that point, as Canadian citizens. They could go off and fight and die for their country, but they couldn't vote. There was strong pressure from both the Department of Indian Affairs and from these two gentlemen especially to enfranchise the whole group. Johnny and Sammy and some others of their friends asked people to put up a show of hands to see who would be interested in enfranchising. But there was no minutes taken of this meeting and there were no uh, members of the Department of Indian Affairs present when it happened. So Johnny reported back to the Indian agent. They were willing to consider enfranchisement. The department started to set in motion a committee that would be in charge of enfranchising the reserve, the whole reserve. And it was the committee that made the decision under Section 112 of the Indian Act, because that section of the Indian Act did not require the band's consent for enfranchisement. They had to change the law so that they could enfranchise the whole reserve. In 1958, uh, they passed an order in council, allowing the entire band to be enfranchised. They would, in quotation marks, cease to be Indians. There were 115 members and 56 of them were adults. So some of them were children who were enfranchised as well. According to the oral history, the band members said that they felt coerced into it and they were not prepared for it. A lot of things were not explained to them about how the process would happen, what would be the result of it, and some of their responsibilities as citizens, including paying taxes and other things like that, that they were not familiar with because they had not been able to or had to deal with that up to this point. As time moved on, Native people began to realize that there were difficulties with the Indian Act, and so there were pushes for changes to the Indian Act. There was a group of women who fought changes that they wanted to institute to Section 121B of the Indian Act, which said that if a woman who had status married a man who did not have status, she would lose her Indian status. And so in 1985, they were able to convince the government to pass a bill called Bill C-31, which allowed for the those people who had been disenfranchised and their children to be reinstated with Indian status. So the Michelle Band people within four years of the passing of Bill C-31 in 1985, some 400 of them were reinstated as having status. And then they began to talk about reestablishing the Michelle Band or Michelle First Nation. 
over time, the Michelle Band has gone through de- several different ways of trying to reestablish who they are in the eyes of the government. We took the government to court in 2001, and the government put roadblocks in the way, basically, and they ended up with Michelle dropping the court case because the choice was either we drop the court case or we'd lose it on a technicality. It's not that we want to be created. It's that we want the government to recognize that we still exist. That was Selena Lawyer, a member of the Michelle Band in Alberta. In 1958, her community was forced into enfranchising. And to this day, the members of the band are still fighting to be recognized by the federal government. While some First Nation people are fighting to get their status back, which was lost because of forced enfranchisement, others are trying to distance themselves entirely from their Indian status and the Indian Act. Honey, bonjour. Hello everyone, I'm Isaac Murdoch and I'm from Serpent River First Nation and I'm Ojibwe. So I remember my mother talking about the rights and freedoms of Indigenous peoples and she said that there was something very wrong with how Indigenous people were being treated. And so she was always very active with missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so she knew that there was a systemic racist issue within the system of Canada and that there was a genocide that was happening against Indigenous people. She always said that, you know, we have to to make a stand. And I remember when Nelson Mandela was trying to be freed from prison, I felt that it was a really good idea at that point not to be a part of the Indian Act. And my mother said that uh, my life would be better without it. So it was quite the journey to try to not be under the Indian Act, uh, because at that time you had to enfranchise to get out. And so I remember my application to get out, or my request, went to a special committee, and I was removed from the Indian Act. So I lived on the reserve for many, many years, and not having a status card or not being under the Indian Act certainly had its challenges. So, for example, my basic human rights of living in a house were not honoured by the administration or by the political bodies in my reserve. They simply said, we can't provide you with anything because you're not a registered band member anymore. And so my basic human rights were infringed upon greatly. I couldn't participate in any political functions or matters. So, for example, I couldn't run for chief and council. I couldn't run for a leadership position. Not that I'd want to, but, you know, I certainly didn't have a say. I didn't have a vote. I I couldn't have access to the benefits that Indigenous Fairs gives to Indigenous people in regards to health or education. And so I lived in tents and shacks for many, many years just simply because I didn't have any housing. So life was really hard during that time, and I felt that maybe it would be a good idea to get my Indian status back. And so I remember trying to go through application processes to get my status back, and I just could never follow through with it. Something at the end of the day told me, no, don't, that this is a very racist system that was used as a genocide against our people, and that I'm an Ishnabek, and that we have our own set of governance and our own set of laws that we follow, and that we're a nation of people, the Anishinaabek nation. We're a free people. We don't fall under the umbrella of the Indian Act and their policies. I think for myself, that is, is, it's an oppressive terminology because we have inherent rights and responsibilities that we get from our parents in the land, that we get from the spirits. We don't get it from Ottawa. We do not get it from legislation or policy. So for me, status is is not a, a term that we should be using at all. And I think that uh, we should really think about how we're going to move forward and creating our own governments and our own laws and our own systems outside of the legal Canadian framework. So I've always felt like we don't need to have a status card, that it's a symbol of oppression. And so I've 
I've often made call outs to people to send me their status cards. I mean, even though they won't be removed from the register and even though they might even go back and pay the $10 or $15 and get another card. But the idea is to try to liberate people to say, you know what, we are Indigenous people that are being oppressed by the Canadian government. And these cards are symbols of, of this oppression and that we need to start getting rid of them. And so I've asked people to mail me their, their cards, and they have. All over North America, they've mailed me their Indian status cards in the States, all over Canada. And I intend to create an art piece out of it one day, once I get enough of them. That was Isaac Murdoch, who got rid of his status card. He's Ojibwe and from Serpent River First Nation, and a member of the Omanan Art Collective. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today we're talking about the Indian Act with author Bob Joseph. Bob, there's a growing interest in abolishing the Indian Act, and some people have gone so far as cutting up their status cards in opposition. But then you have communities and people like Lynn Gell trying to get their status back. Where do you stand on this issue? Do we get rid of the Indian Act? Um, yes, I'm definitely in the camp that sees us getting rid of the Indian Act. The Indian Act isn't there to help people. And I can see the status as being a benefit. You you don't pay transactional taxes and you can be tax exempt in your income tax. And, you know, there's there's those benefits, but the restrictions far outweigh the benefits. Mm-hmm. I if you live on way. reserve. That's if you live on reserve, right? Like I still pay reserve. taxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I'm a <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, a vicious cycle, edge. really. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. It is. Yeah, the Indian Act, I would love to see it gone sooner than later because long-term, if it's coming down to the survival of the nation, it can't survive under the Indian Act. Right. It's not designed to do it. So let's say tomorrow we wake up, boom, Indian Act is gone. What do we replace it with? I see a couple of things. First of all, on, on health care, one of the things that we saw, the uh, the NISCA nation, I'm not promoting uh, the NISCA model. I'm just saying there's something that works for them. They waived the exemption. They said, you know, we're going to pay taxes. When the treaty-making process is over, our people will pay taxes. What they felt and what they negotiated was if we're paying taxes – then we get taxpayer equity funding, like other taxpayers, for health care, housing, and education. We'll be better off as a nation if our people are paying taxes than if they're not paying taxes. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense. You looked at K-12 through education under the Indian Act, where they're getting substantially less money you know, than the school district just down the road. Because Indian Affairs is so chronically underfunded, that was creating problems. So their view is, if, but if our people are paying taxes, we get taxpayer equity funding for our schools. We'll be better off as a nation in the long term. In the long term, yes. But mm -hmm. we're talking about housing shortages. We're talking about uh, limited job opportunities. We're talking about some of these reserves are in the middle of nowhere and don't have the capacity to build a casino or bingo hall or um, businesses. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. how do you then fill that gap between, you know, the distant future where we're all healthy and happy uh, uh, and left the Indian Act to to this what's happening now? One of the big challenges in trying to give people sort of the uh, prescriptive solution is the cultural diversity, right? When we think about Indigenous peoples, First Nations in Canada, there's over 600 different bands. They belong to 11 major language families. There's over 50 different dialects. And then there's all of the regional differences. So what works in one place won't necessarily work mm-hmm. in another. And so it's just important, I think, for for listeners to sort of pick up on that. Yeah. So people always ask me, we think about it, the Niska Treaty or, you know, some other kind of an agreement that Canada and a province might negotiate with people. They always ask me, is this a cookie cutter approach? Is this a blueprint? And I always tell people, no, it's not. 
what works for, for the Niska people, and they are quite remote and in the middle of nowhere, but they have forestry and mining mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, lava bed parks, and they're into big game outfitting, and we're doing a, you know, sports fishing businesses and that kind of stuff. So, you know, in, in terms of uh, the opportunity, it would really have to be decided on a case-by-case basis. And I think, you know, for healthcare, instead of the funding th- flowing through Indian Affairs, they're working with Health Canada to get that taxpayer equity funding, because I know some of the challenges around healthcare and a lot of the community people you talk to will tell you these stories as well. They're, my mom's got uh, fibromyalgia, but Indian Affairs will only fund one type of pill and it totally doesn't help her at all. And there's another pill that actually works, but they won't fund it. And, mm-hmm. and so to uh, break free of that relationship, but to create another one with Health Canada that's being funded on the basis that other Canadians are being funded is probably not a bad position to be in mm-hmm. than to be chronically underfunded and facing cutbacks and Certainly. And what about the treaties? Could you could you fulfill those kinds of things with 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 the treaties? Like, could that replace the Indian Act? Absolutely. You know, you think about some of those treaties. They're huge treaties, right? If they could get into revenue sharing and all of the resource development, you're a totally funded nation. Yeah. And you're you're in, you're in unbelievable shape. And so, they can decide what to do with that money, invest it, or put it into healthcare, housing, education for uh, their people. They can decide on development that's maybe more appropriate. Um, for but that's the, unlikely, right? That the government would say, "Okay, we're just going to rip up this oppressive piece of legislation, uh, and we're." Gonna going to go with the treaties. Why Why won't they go with the treaties? What's think, the problem there? Well, we talked about it earlier. It's the shifting nature of federal politics, too, and provincial politics, right? You can get a couple of steps ahead with one politician, and then somebody else comes in and, you know, messes it all up, takes you a, a step and a half backwards. It's the same problem for the federal government as it is for an indigenous community trying, mm. to, trying to make some change that way. But that was our experience with uh, Gordon Campbell. Gordon Campbell became the premier of British Columbia. And his mandate was, we're going to have a referendum on the Niska Treaty. We're going to vote on it, yes or no, do we want it, which was a scary proposition. And uh, there should be equality. Those were his platforms, and they were viewed as largely anti-Indian platforms. They're, and as anti-Indian as you can get, equality is like, we don't care that you're, you know, you're Kuala enough. You're going to be like everybody else, and that's mm-hmm. how we're going to treat you. And, and back so, to the uh, original problem, right? The assimilation. The, yeah, yeah. So we're, Which, uh, we're, we're further from that. So yeah. the tribes sort of uh, mobilized around all of the development, and we're using, you know, sort of the duty to consult law to slow down any objectives that he had. You know, anytime you wanted to build something, the Sea to Sky Highway, there was somebody there saying, you got to consult with us. and. Mm-hmm. We're going to tie up all of your good hard work for three to five years and unless you come and talk to us about what we think is important. And so that sort of duty to consult piece gives people really incredible political power if they know how to leverage that, right? And That's another book though, Bob. It's another it entirely different book. <laughs> we can't get into that one here yeah, today. We've got an hour. Sure. Bob, what what is the one thing you would want – Canadians to know about this about this legislation? Well, I think for Canadians just to know that it is on its way out, that since 1982, we've been working diligently as a country on self-determination, self-governance, and self-reliance. It's, sometimes it's happening in treaties like NISCA, and other times it's happening in self-government agreements like West Bank First Nation. Mm-hmm. But we're down the road. Uh, people are always concerned, taxpayers especially, that it's not going to work or that, you know, Something's going to go wrong, and there's usually a, a fair bit of uh, chicken littling. You know, the sky's going to fall. And what we've seen around some of those activities, though, is that the sky isn't falling, that there are actually some fairly functional relationships between local governments and provinces and the feds. Uh, NISCA, for example, have largely been out of the picture. I can tell you the agreements that I've seen negotiated are working and have a really good chance of working. We're just, And that's what the current federal government's doing. We're going to have to wait and see it's that kind of ebb and flow of uh, federal politics that can Certainly. really slow things down. But I think, you know, all of the economic indicators say it's better for the country, the growth would be better, things that, that people people really would want, but we're still hung up on old stereotypes largely because of the Indian Act. Mm -hmm. Bob, I wish I could talk to you all day. I might call you back later. I appreciate it. (laughs) And thank you. Anytime, anytime. Thank you. It's a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Bob Joseph is the founder of Corporate Training, Inc., which provides training on Indigenous relations. He's also the author of several books, including 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. 
His new book, Indigenous Relations, Insights, Tips, and Suggestions to Make Reconciliation a Reality, is out now. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. If you want to learn more or share any of the stories you heard on the show today, you can find them on our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved, or find us on Facebook and Twitter. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I go say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.